Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We are happy to have Gertz Schottman in the studio presenting Switches for Experts. It's how to choose a switch for your application. Of course, partnered with DigiKey Electronics, the exclusive sponsor of all Worth Electronic webinars. Now, this is Switches for Experts, so you should have a basic knowledge and understanding of our electromechanical components. A little bit about uh, Gertz here. He is a field application engineer in our electromechanical division at Worth Electronic right across the pond. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar, uh, much like all of our other webinars, it will be recorded and sent to you because you have registered for the presentation. You'll be getting it in an email later on this week or early next week. Simply look for that email from webinar team at we-online.com. Now, after the presentation, we'll gladly be answering some questions and you can test out the questions tab. Uh, simply ask away. If we don't get to your question or if you think of it a little bit later, simply reply to that email from webinar team at we-online.com. Don't miss out on our next webinar. It's actually next Tuesday. We are ending the month with electrical contact resistance on September 27th. Register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. Now let's begin today's Worth Electronic webinar with Gertz Schottman. Switches for experts, how to choose a switch for your application partnered with DigiKey Electronics. So that's right. Today we want to talk about switches. And of course, uh, it's not meant to talk uh, about network switches, but electrical switches that you find in so many applications. Now, let me start to share my screen with you. And uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen here. So, hello. Um, thanks, Amelia, for this nice introduction. My name is Gert Schottmann, and uh, as mentioned, I work as a FAE here at Word Electronics since 2015. Yeah, and uh, one part of this role is to support customers on their specific projects and problems and so on. And just a little story, uh, it once happened to me um, that a very experienced design engineer called me about a situation he had with a simple tax switch. And uh, therefore he was complaining that our switch had an issue. So um, I knew this guy um, has been very long in the job and so I had really no doubt that he knew what he does. Well, at the end it turned out that he had completely overloaded a poor little switch in his design. Yeah, and he burned quite a few of them. But the major point uh, here to me was that uh, during our discussion and scrutinizing around of this problem, it became obvious to me that many details about switches, just very basic things you would think, yeah, and they were just not on his focus. So um, the goal for today is to raise your instincts and your sensitivity um, of some more details around switches that might help you to choose whether you buy a switch A or B or C and make your product successful, long-lasting and uh, worthy with it. Yeah. So before we start uh, to jump into the agenda, the major question is, what is a switch or what does a switch? Yeah, of course, I know everyone here knows what a switch does. So let me click on it. And yeah, of course, now it's dark. Let's uh, turn it on again. And there will be light. So on, off, on. And that's, that's really all about it. Well, in general, yes, that's what a switch does. But around that, there are so many questions like, for instance, how and when and what if. So we would like to dive a little bit deeper into some of those aspects. And uh, as you might have guessed correctly, today's presentation is not about introducing you all the switches you can find on the market and all of its particular functions. It's more about uh, things that you don't find on a data sheet or what to do with the information uh, on the data sheet and how to how to read it. So here's our topics for today. 
However, I'm not going to read down all of this uh, here since we're going to work them out anyway. And um, at the end of the seminar, as Amelia has mentioned, you will have the chance to come up with your question in a Q&A session. So we're heading right into the point uh, selection of a switch. Now, um, if you start a design from scratch, then you really have to determine what you need. And this can be really complex. It all applies on all components that have to work together as a complete system. Choosing components from your proven prior designs, that can really help you um, to avoid surprises. Since you know what you get, you already know the component. On the other hand, this could also prevent your designs to be up to date and innovative if you stick with old technologies for looped for too long. Then selecting a good manufacturer, we call it here trustful source, that can save you time and money. So there are a couple of other trainings that we also also offer. One is also about quality. So if you like to hear more about that, let us know. So points to consider are like, do you get full product documentation, reports of environmental testing and conformity, application notes, um, a true sales support, maybe in person, and of course, digital layout and 3D data that help you to speed up your design process. But the list um, goes on. So some components that you find uh, you can find on a data sheet only. So if you then tend to buy it, you maybe have to order it in hundreds of thousands before the pro production even gets started. Or like these days, the, the lead time is completely blasting away your time to market plans. Then uh, if it comes to production lifetime, how long is a component going to be continued? Um, the other question from user is how long are you going to offer uh, your product? If it's a one shot production, then you don't have to care too much about, but if you want to continue um, producing this product, then you should know um, how long you can get the product. Now, in terms of um, the selection of components, um, do you really need such special features, parts in your design and special measures and so on? Or could you use a state-of-the-art standard component? Even finding a second source could be even easier with uh, standard parts. And um, of course, cost. Uh, if it's about cost, a component with a higher buy price is not necessarily the most expensive one. Or you can say the other way around. If you buy too cheap, then you may be paid double. Another question is if you if you get hands on samples easily, not only the drawing on the drawing board, but only if you physically have the part in your hands, then you can run a trial and check if the system can be produced as you uh, have planned it. So this is still all very basic considerations up to now. And there was no part selected. So let's go more in detail. Point one is more about the general points, like mechanical. How does it fit into your design? How is it going to be operated uh, from side or from top? Or um, then functional, then of course, number of poles is important. Yeah? Um, then uh, if it's momentary or latching, uh, you turn, push, rotate, or if it's hidden inside a, as a temper contact. Then of course your electrical requirements like voltage, current, all the mandatory things. Yeah. And then we go into more specific, the IP class, for example. And I don't know, for some reason, this is one of the most wanted options. But we talk about that later as well. So then the type of electrical load, that can be really important. And maybe you remember my initial story with the burnt um, switches. But we talk about that also later. Then 
what does the production process look like when it comes to soldering? If it's reflow down or wave or double wave, selective hand vapor phase soldering or whatever. Is there also a critical influence from the environment like dust, moisture, salt spray, chemicals, gas, very high or very low temperatures? Um, the component is sitting in a big or small enclosure with or without ventilation. Uh, that's all points to consider. Then does the application require special safety class or a certified conformity to meet certain standards like ATEX if it comes if it comes to explosive um, environmental or medical or military applications? And maybe you already think you found the, the perfect match, um, but it's not really qualified to use in your application because it's just not allowed to use there. Also, ESD safety could be a point as well. Uh, also, vandalism protection and so on. Yeah. Now, many of these kind of filters, let's call it filters, they automatically running through our brain even before we are aware of that. And that is also a risk. It's a risk to miss out an essential point. So a checklist is always a good idea for this point. Now, here are some more points uh, you got to take into account. Assuming that the tech points are defined like uh, ampere and voltage and power and so on. So we can give that a tick. Now, maybe you can switch your position into the perspective of the user. And now look on the final product. How is the general appearance? Like you are not knowing what is inside and how it works. Well, what is your impression? Your feeling, and finally you're judging and everybody judges. Um, about these products. Does it really look like a professional and trustful equipment or just like a do-it-yourself project and only like if it stole it over the last centuries? Well, decision is up to you. And uh, yeah, all this is uh, closely linked to the question of usability. Even if it comes with a nice and creative design, well, I'm not talking about the one that you see on the screen here. Uh, you should ask yourself, would you understand how the appliance is meant to be used? How it should, be, uh, should work and how to be operated? And finally, not to miss the real feeling when you touch an operator switches. Um, this is the so-called haptic or tactile feedback. Perhaps it's for the device that a firefighter uses, and he wears thick leather gloves to protect his hands from fire, or a medical device that has to be operated with thin latex gloves. There are so many examples and so many special use cases. So if you push the button, how does it feel? How does it even sound? And altogether, can this make a bit of difference? Whether the user perceives that the device is uh, be of high quality and value or even not. So to conclude this point, don't start to look for the special electrical parameters only. You better uh, list up uh, all requirements by looking close to your target application. What sound and, and feeling do I get from a switch? This leads me right to the next point on our agenda about the characteristics of switches. Um, but first of all, let's do a quick summary of this chapter. I've not been talking too much about volts and amperes and so on. Of course, this is absolutely mandatory to respect, but uh, this is not what makes your product great. You have to pay full attention to all the other points as well. And uh, here are even some more to follow. Each of the following points and chapters in this presentation, they could be relevant to find the best fitting switch for your application as well. And don't mind, uh, you don't have to take your notes here. You receive a PDF after, after the training. Now, so far, we're done with this for the moment. As mentioned, let's jump to the next point, mechanical switch characteristics. 
And when we talked about mechanical switch characteristics, it's a tongue breaking thing. Yeah? This does not mean uh, the dimension or the, the orientation of the, of the component. In most application switches are representing a human machine interface as they are required to control an appliance or device or a system. Now, and therefore, a switch should be selected appropriate to its designated usage, of course. Now, um, you remember the term usability when you look at this sort of uh, overdone, um, I call it an smartphone, you know, with the toggle switches and so on, and sliding switch, that could not be useful at all. Okay, beside of all these uh, general attributes, there two features are important to consider. One is the actuation force and travel or stroke. It means the way or the distance an actuator needs to be moved until a switch is electrically operating, like opening or closing the contact. Just a little side story <laughs> for your amusement. Uh, I recognize in most Hollywood movies, the actors have to pull really large and heavy main switches with most with two hands like this. Yeah. And um, I remember like in Jurassic Park, uh, that girl even had to pump a couple of times before she could activate the switch. Uh, well knowing that the Velociraptors and T-Rexes are coming closer from behind. Yeah, yeah but sorry for that. Um, well, that means an inappropriately chosen switch that can lead to an unintuitive handling up to misoperation and um, maybe like it with double pressing um, due to the miss, uh, missing tactile feedback if you remember the firefighter with his leather gloves but how to give this kind of characteristics a value unit of measurement that makes it easier to compare different components. Well, a force and travel diagram is, the, is a good way to look at it. Now, let me switch to the laser pointer here and I explain it for a moment. See the actuation force here, that is the force that needs to be applied. And here we see the stroke that means the way this kind of actuator, you have to push it and that's the way you have to move it. So what's gonna happen from some point zero when it's uh, still standing, then you uh, apply with your finger and you push on it and then uh, the force is rising. And we all know that there is a, a snap dome inside of the switch. Uh, and uh, this also the one that does this kind of click zone. And this is exactly where it snaps over uh, until it comes to the switching position, which happens here. And then the, the force that um, rises to infinite because it can't go any further. You're just on the end position here. And um, this is how to read this kind of diagram. And this is a typical curve for tech switch. So by only reading this kind of diagram, I can assume what uh, type of switch is this, because every type of switch has a different sort of curve. Now, let's call this uh, the travel options. And so every kind of switch has its typical kind of curve. There are different categories to tell apart. Depending on the target application, there can be a big difference in how a switch shall operate. If you look at this, it's the same like before. And here we can see the characteristics of a mid travel type compared to the uh, short travel type that we saw here. Um, this kind of measures are not fixed in any rules, like this is um, separately from, from vendor to vendor. Yeah. And here again, and even clearer, you can see in this kind uh, of curve, the snap point, um, when the contact really snaps over, this is here, and here does the contact. When it's released, uh, again, 
then is the second curve. Yeah. So uh, this type of uh, switch is very often found in household appliances, like uh, washing machines, for example. And very often the switches operate in a vertical direction to the to the PCB. And also with a latching function means push it once for on and a second time for off. Now we turn to long travel. And this means the travel can be up to 2.5 millimeters and even more. Yeah. One reason uh, is to avoid accidental operation. For example, in a car, when you don't look at the switch because you want to keep your eyes on the traffic and your fingers already know the exact position where the switch is located, like a blind operation. And uh, by the way, most research I found about usability and ergonomics um, is related to the automotive sector. So um, this all meant the, the operating behavior for different switches. What is important for the user is to receive a clear feedback. This can be haptic or tactile feedback, like a mechanical snap action. Um, you can hear this one. See this little switch, yeah? And um, yeah, mechanical snap action like this one. And uh, as well as a vibration that you find in many digital devices like tablets and smartphones and so on. Also, a combination on pure sound or light can be used. But touch switches, uh, for example, the sound comes from the internal snap dome, as shown. It's a, it's a fully mechanical sound. And for a big rocker switch like this one is, a main switch, yeah, and you can clearly hear and feel the operation action. So on the other hand, with some switch components, you would hardly hear or feel any action. Therefore, this is being realized by additional mechanics, which is absolutely independent from any electrical context. Like you can find it uh, in this example with encoders. Uh, rotating coders, you can turn them in either direction. And uh, inside, they see, you see this kind of uh, plastic wheel and it has little bumpers. And this kind of spring is always finding its position in, in the valley between these bumpers. Yeah? So this is how it's uh, realized. So let's sum up. There's no general value for a direct full comparison. Main factors are force and travel and the tactility or haptics. So let's have a look on two different switches that we want to compare. And they are really different, just as an example here. So we see the tact switch and we see a push button switch which has, has a way, uh, a much longer way. Yeah. And maybe this could help you to visualize differences. So try, I try to show it with this kind of diagram. So, but uh, just for your information, this kind of graphics, graphics is nothing common. Yeah, uh, not anyone is using it so far. It's just a proposal or an attempt how to make different characteristics visible. So uh, if necessary, you could even add more parameters and choose the way you switch uh, you prefer to make it visible for you. What we see here is the force, um, the tactile, tactile and uh, the, the way it goes to travel. And you see those kind of switches are totally different uh, compared for that way that has a much higher force here. Uh, that has a tactility that is lacking absolutely, and therefore this one has longer travel. Yeah. So um, it's up to you if you want to use something like that. But once again, this is not a standard. Yeah. Okay, so done with this for now. Let's talk about a little bit of quality, or not quality. If you if you look to these pictures, yeah. so this is really what we would not expect. And all these uh, images are all of examples that we observed or was observed, works were observed by our switch uh, TQM 
in the laboratory when doing market comparison and um, even brush customer requests when we have been asked for supporting them. Yeah. And partly, uh, honestly, it was sort of shocking what we found from some manufacturers. Yeah. You see the corrosion here on the pictures. Um, this is why we're talking about quality here in detail. And the problem is for anyone who's buying switches, it's the fact that on the data sheet, many switches look almost identical, but the level of quality can only be determined by extensive testing. We've got another presentation to offer about the quality of switch components as mentioned before. So if you're interested, let us know. So one of the most critical points um, is corrosion, We've seen that on the pictures. But what is the risk of corrosion? Well, inside the switch, it's clear, corrosion leads to an increase of the contact resistance. And higher contact resistance lead to heat development, means up to burning of fire, or just melting of plastic, like we can see here. Yeah? Um, second uh, chance is um, no electrical contact. It's breaking off, like interrupting a break. At least then there's no more danger, just the machine doesn't work anymore. And it's also not what we want. So how can we minimize the risk? Of course, everyone is praising their outstanding quality, but how to find out what is true? So our recommendation is to choose components with proven test reports, following general accepted standards like UL, NEC, IEC, CQC, or whatever is requested. A respectable manufacturer will provide you all the relevant uh, test reports uh, to you and maybe grant insight in how testing was performed, as this is also can be uh, very different. Yeah. And um, by the way, I can't avoid to, to mention here that Word Electronic is performing all electrical tests for switches under full load. And this is not the standard. Yeah. Not everybody's doing it like this, but this is the way how we can be as close as possible to the real life scenario. So check out the, the test um, conditions. So at this point, we're talking about the contact plating only. So what is on the top surface, mm, not the full conductor material. And why is this important? There are different contact platings in use for switches chosen by its properties. And the aim is to achieve a reliable contact for long lasting secure operation, of course. These properties are, for example, resistance against erosion, pitting or burn down or material mitigation, especially under DC. Um, oh, the resistance of the contact not to glue or to weld together during operation or of course a low contact resistance because with the low contact resistance there is no heat coming up and the arc extinguishing behavior when opening or closing a contact because the longer an arc is lasting the more material gets burned and the residues of the burning may increase the contact resistance again so it could be so it could become kind of of a vicious circle so let's have a look on the major platings, um, the major plating materials. So real is still what is on top. And of course, there's gold. Gold seems, uh, even don't know why, it seems to be the most desirable uh, material of all. But this is not necessarily the, the case. So gold is good for uh, application with small currents, it offers a low contact resistance, and you only need a low contact force. Um, therefore, uh, this is resulting in a higher number of mating cycles. Yeah. So gold is corrosion free, but it requires a nickel underlay. And this is a quality point that you could find. Mm, if you have a standard material like copper and you put gold on top, the gold will disappear into the um, into the uh, 
main material. So you need to have this under layer for uh, stopping the gold to, to fading away. We all know that, uh, of course, gold is expensive and it only live, uh, offers a limited solar ability. Then it comes silver and silver definitely is the most widely used in many, many types of switches. Yeah. Um, of course, it's uh, well known as the best electrical co uh, conductor in the world. And there are so many um, different alloys out there um, that uh, can gain uh, some, some different behaviors like here with the tin oxide uh, against the welding. Yeah. Um, but however, you know that uh, silver is tending to build a kind of oxidation film, um, which is leading to frit means a small um, layer of, of, um, of gases and, and residues. And uh, if you want to break that, you need uh, a minimum um, voltage and current uh, to break through that. Yeah. Last but not least, I want to mention about tungsten or molybdenum, so especially used for for the high heavy industry, for high currents, and um, even in the automotive sector. Now, still talking about quality, and because we've been talking so nicely about quality, so I won't miss out to raise some words to general quality points around the materials of other switch components, not the conductor material. So the first page of this topic, we found some components that are not electrical components, but parts of the housing or the inner parts. You remember the melted plastic examples? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A switch, no matter how big or small it is, maybe represents a complete system. And this system can only be as good as the weakest component inside. And we already mentioned points like environmental influences like temperature, humidity, and so on. Another critical component, especially inside of the switch, is the snap dome. And we already learned, learned about it, um, that this snap dome is responsible for the push force and for the haptic feeling and for the, for the click sound as well. And it's also responsible for the electrical contact. So therefore it's silver plated normally. So if we look inside here, um, it's relevant for the return on the initial position, the operation force, also creating the mechanical and the electrical lifetime. And it's giving you the tactile feedback. Yeah. Now the question is, what makes a good, uh, what makes a good snap dome? Yeah, is it the material? I could either have you could either have it in beryllium copper or stainless steel or phosphor bronze. While stainless steel offers the best all over performance and longevity, so you should get the information what is inside of your switch from the data sheet. Now here we can look inside. And when you need to select uh, a new packed switch, now you know what to look for. So that's it for this topic. And uh, let's return back to the agenda. So next point is about switching AC or DC loads. So we can find uh, different ampere ratings on data sheet and very often directly printed onto the switches as well. Like you can see these markings here. Yeah? Even uh, with AC loads, uh, even with AC loads, there are different limitations to respect marked here in yellow. Yeah? You can see here yellow and uh, the voltage AC. And um, yeah, and marked in yellow, green, and blue, like for resistive and, and motor load and sometimes also capacitive load. And what does that really mean? Uh, just want to switch on and off. Well, there are two major points to pay particular attention to. One is the contact pitting due to arcs and sparks. 
and heat development. Already spoke about that. So when closing and when opening a switch contact under load, a spark or an arc may be arise. The higher the voltage is, the higher is the risk. Under alternating current, the sine wave is at zero amps two twice per cycle, which leads an arc to extinguish very quickly. And this is what we want to achieve. Yeah. Now with direct current situation is quite different. Voltage and currents are always on the same level. And when the connection is interrupted, the current wants to keep it, the flow going, even through the air, and an arc appears. Two points can counter direct this, a very quick break between the switching contacts, and this is why, the, why these are all snap action switches, and increasing the, the total distance between the contacts. The problems with arcs and sparks is the pitting on the contact points. We see here an image uh, on the lower left-hand side here. Um, that's how switching contacts could look like in a switch or in a relay. There's some kind of pills here, mainly of silver and or silver alloy. So it's not only a plating, it's really solid contacts here. Over time, with every spark that occurs, the silver pills disappear. Uh, this is the so-called pitting. After the pills have been eaten up, the switch has uh, reached its electrical lifetime. Any further operation will be out of specification. You can't give any further guarantee for a safe operation then. And many of you might have seen uh, a switch uh, um, lightning inside when, when you switched off or on any, any uh, particular switch in your household. Yeah. So about the contact pitting, you see, um, no, we see here um, again how it's going to happen, and it's eating up the the pills like this. Yeah. So number two is heat development. Um, as we all know, each conductor could also be seen as a resistor. When a current flows through a resistor, it warms up. This is known as the Joule's effect. Well, electrical work or electrical power is the product of voltage and current over a certain time. Means the higher voltage and the higher the current and the longer the time, the more heat is developed. Applications can be very different in the type of load and therefore show different behavior even driven under AC or DC can be totally different. At the end, we have to secure not to overload the switch in the final application, including the power on and the power off moments. And therefore, you need to know what kind of load is attached. There can be, for example, resistive load, like the most kind of heater elements. However, during the start of period of many common devices, they show a significant inverse current, which can rise up to multiple times the value of the nominal consumption. Over and above that, this startup period can last from microseconds to milliseconds up to seconds in some cases. Yeah. Now, what we see at resistive load, uh, this looks like the optimal case, like power on, machine running, power off, silence. And same behavior and AC and DC, all following Ohm's law. And for AC, the full power is real power, means the sine wave, as we see here, um, of voltage and currents are in absolute conjunction, running without phase shift, like you see here on the diagram. Now, still talking about a 100% resistive load is what we find, for example, in traditional light bulbs, in halogen lamps, and so on. Of course, not the LEDs. But the conductive material inside here has a PTC characteristics. Means um, the resistance is very low when the material is, is cold, turning higher as the temperature rises until it's getting in a sort of balance. Because of that inverse current, um, this can be really high up to 15 times the rate of current. 
of course, for a short period, but uh, very high. And um, yeah, if you think for a projector lamp, for example, yeah. And with a curve like that, um, it looks like looking like that, but still in phase, there is no shift since it's still resistive load. Now, what is different with inductive loads? There is inductive load when you're using a transformer or coil, a relay, electromagnetic, whatever. Uh, at startup under DC, like we all learned at school, <laughs> the voltage leads the current while the inducted voltage counteracts the increase according to Lenz rule. So for DC magnets or relays, the inverse current does not exceed the rated current. That's why it's flat here and it's not going over here. When you switch off, a spike is created by induction. That's what you see here. And this can result in a really high voltage transient. The effect is used in ignition coils and combustion engines, like in cars, for example. But it could also do harm on the switch by generating a spark here. So now turn to AC. The picture totally changes. Transformer relays and all kinds of coils show significant higher inverse current under AC. This in detail, so uh, with magnetic remnants and saturation and so on, it's a fully chapter itself. We're not going to run through this today. For us, it's important to know that the AC inrush current could be about 10 to 15 times the value of the rated current. And it's important to know how long the inrush takes. Further, there is a phase shift between voltage and current. You can see it here. Um, and that leads to reactive power or idle power. This effect is putting in additional load to the wires and the switch as well um, as it is a part of the electrical line. Yeah? So, and uh, we heard that there could also be capacitive load. In a DC circuit, a capacitor acts like a shortcut for some microseconds. For a little tact switch, maybe that means the end of its lifetime. <laughs> and that was exactly the situation in my initial story that I told you in the very beginning. The engineer wanted to switch a laser diode directly just with a little tact switch. The rated nominal values of the laser diode were absolutely in line or even below the ratings of the switch. But the inrush current killed the tact switch on the first or second attempt always. I think he better should have used the kind of driver for the laser diode. So you see how important this can be. Um, now the situation is changing when AC is applied. Once again, under AC, the inverse current depends on the voltage of the sine wave in the moment of switching. So the best point would be here or here. Um, when the voltage is about zero volt, but you can't control this by hand. So for charging converters in power supplies or frequency converters, usually you cannot avoid high inverse currents anyway. The curve could look like this, where the current in red here is leading the voltage in blue and uh, the green wave is, is the load, I added it here. And we can determine there is a phase shift as well. So when it comes to electrical drives, no matter if AC or DC time, usually they show a high inverse current just because more power and thus more current is required to accelerate the rot rotating flywheel mass to the nominal speed than the power that is required to maintain the speed. Usually motors are not switched by hand. They come with a sort of motor control. But in some cases, uh, you just have to have a bare switch in front. Yeah? Example could be a, a water pump in, in a camper or a bilge pump in a boat, maybe a wiper motor in an old car yeah? or a fan or many power tools like drills or whatever. But what 
kind of load is a motor load. We learned about capacitive, resistive, and inductive, uh, inductive load just before. In an electrical motor, we can find all these types together, like the windings of the copper wire are inductive, but the wire also has a resistance itself and the starting capacity or line filler is adding capacitive load. And that's exactly the point. Most electrical products, appliances, devices, and machines compromise a combination of at least two, if not all three types of electrical loads. However, it is important to see ahead of how the device will behave. And of course, what does that mean to the switch? Over and above that, you might consider about inrush current limiting solutions like NTC solution or load switching ICs, or what is most appropriate for you. So that's bringing us back to the first slide of the, capacity, uh, of the, of the uh, chapter now. And now we know what is behind, yeah? why it's so different between AC and DC. Just looking at the first one, we see here 16 amps uh, at 250 volts for pure resistive load. Uh, in green then, the rated motor load is only four amps since there is reactive power that we have to respect. While the inrush current here looks fairly high with 24 amps, but this is not lasting very long. And for DC, you know that we have to avoid arcs and spikes, which occur much more likely under DC. Now, but how have all these values been calculated or determined? <laughs> Rolling dice? No, surely not. You're right, there are standards and plates. Talking about the IEC 61058 applies to switches for appliances. And the rule says the, the switches are intended to control electrical appliances and, and other equipment for household or similar purposes with a rated voltage not exceeding 480 volts and a rated current not exceeding 63 amps. That's exactly what you can read on the UL website. In the standard, you can find a definition about the test load for electrical endurance test clearly explains how a test must be carried out uh, to be compliant. And according to the standard, the inrush time is also defined to be between 10 or 50, up to 50 milliseconds. And the maximum inrush current is limited to factors of the rated current, like 10 up to 16 times the rated current, depending on the type of load of your application. Oh, that was quite a lot so far. Hope that was all clear. Now we're jumping, closing the point and jumping to the next one, which is about IP rating. We're still in the time frame, I hope. So IP rating, you all know there is IP classification in place, which is defined now here under the IEC 6529 standard. It regulates the protection against the ingress of solid particles or liquids into a certain appliance or components. Yeah, by reading. Um, now, if it comes to IP, then I don't know why, but IP67 is often requested from the product designers and marketing departments just to be on the safe side yeah, or ahead of the competition sounding like a quality argument, which is not necessarily one. Yeah. Yes, a waterproof switch is protected against the ingress of dirt or anything else that could affect the function or the contact resistance of the switch. But on the other hand, the solder terminals, and they are free and open accessible on the PCB. However, very often IP67 is not really necessary. Most of the makers of waterproof appliances need to seal the components, the whole housing anyway. So who really needs IP67? Yeah, and I was pushing too fast and uh, you can now read or see the, uh, the answers. Yeah. Who needs it? Customer, of course, with washing process. If uh, washing process is behind, uh, your um, assembling of the PCB, then it um, could make sense, yeah. 
especially for appliances in harsh environment, for PCB that need to be potted, because uh, if there is uncleanliness on the PCB, uh, the, the potting material will, won't just hold yeah, even um, colors uh, or safety and uh, safety um, covers. Yeah. For soldering in vapor phase also, and um, especially for equipment makers that are requesting additional protection yeah, for their products. Now let's uh, have a quick look on the IP rating. You all know it's a two-digit code. You can see um, the point here is a uh, digit one is about the solid pro um, objects and uh, digit two is for liquids or moisture. So there are a huge numbers. So you end up in maybe IP six, seven. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Um, there are also um, extension letters that can be used to additionally specify more details. <clears throat> Sorry, my voice is about to disappear. So, and you can also check out the similar NEMA ratings for enclosures if requested to find out what is the appropriate code, vice versa. This is just another standard like NEMA 6 or 6P would be equal to IP67 here in this case. So yeah, I agree. Standards can be so boring to read, but um, here I've got an interesting fact for you. When we're talking about IP67 or any IP clause in general, that is always related to the IEC 60529. And um, IEC 6529 is applicable for enclosures of electrical equipment. And there's absolutely no relevance for single components on your PCB. So that is why you can use any component in a device which is intended to be waterproof. The sealing is done by the enclosure. So if a switch itself is meant to be IP67, then um, IEC 61058, uh, this one applies then. And the funny thing here is that the testing conditions again follow the specs is that we find in the 60529. So for digit one, the solid objects, the test is uh, satisfactory if no deposit of dust is observable inside the switch after the test, not inside the enclosure, but inside of the switch itself. Yeah. And for the second digit about water or moisture, um, the switch shall withstand the dielectric strength test and inspection must show no trace of water or insulation, uh, which at the end could result in a reduction of creepage and clearance inside of the switch. And of course, these all have to be checked after it's been, um, after testing them, yeah. so after the, um, after contact with water. So if you want to buy a true IP67 switch, watch out for the standard given on the data sheet. And that leads me right to washability. Why washing PCBs? Lately, the washing of assembled PCBs after soldering process is more and more a common request in the market. And what is the reason and what is the aim? First of all is the removal of reasons and flux residues. Uh, solder free, uh, solder pastes with increased resin content and more aggressive fluxes could cause harm on the long term and therefore should be removed. New is and that even no clean uh, solar paste turn out to be difficult to be left on the PCBs. It's kind of ironic that no clean fluxes are the most difficult to clean. Um, when salt activators in the no clean fluxes come into contact with heat or other chemicals, they leave behind a wide residue which is looking like of poor manufacturing quality or maybe could uh, chemically also react with other materials. So a second point is about a 
better inspection, in particular an automatic automated inspection system, the AOI. And there is some, the same for the quality control reasons. If there is a lot of something on your PCB, how would you see the solar joint underneath? And um, PCB and components are getting smaller and smaller. And this has been a trend in electronics for ages, yeah. In these microstructures, any kind of procedures could lead to malfunction and high frequency applications. Anything that is lost, left on the PCB could possibly change the impedance of the system. Further, the, the washing is essential for application of the absolutely cleanliness is crucial, like in medical, military, aerospace. And also not to miss out clean room equipment. So improved aesthetics can make it necessary to clean. Flux residues compromise the cosmetic appearance uh, of printed circuit boards and even make the whole product more or less unattractive. Imagine some, high end, uh, some, some kind of high-end equipment where a customer can see the PCB on the inside. Um, it's looking sort of dirty. Hmm, would you buy that? For example, uh, hi-fi equipment or just a computer mainboard. Yeah? But of course, there are also technical reasons that really require uh, a cleaning process, as it has a significant influence on the processing step that may follow, such as, such as bonding. Uh, without cleaning, you will end up in a poor bond strength. All types of conformal coatings and potting require clean surface. Without cleaning, poor wetting or delamination would be the result. So see, there are so many reasons for washing assembled PCB. Of course, a lot of details have to be respected to avoid severe problems after washing problems. And the problems could be, um, yeah, mainly components that are just not qualified for washing due to many reasons like moisture absorption inside the material, even plastics yeah, can absorb uh, moisture, especially for many kinds of switches. Water or cleaning fluids or agents may enter into small cavities inside and cannot fully dry out from there. Some switches are also filled with grease to ensure a smooth operations over the lifetime. By washing the grease out, could uh, increase the friction on the plastics and the electrical contact, which means a reduced lifetime. Corrosion, heat and salt and agents may react with materials. Changing color or printed markings um, on the AOI failure could lead to an AOI failure. Yeah. It's important to understand that washability um, does not include the full submersion in the water or liquids. And very clearly, washability is not the same like um, IP67. Some just mixed it up. For our products, we give a clear handling advice. As we have already seen, what happens in the detail if the details are not respected. So the last advice for this topic is, if you're planning to establish a washing process, get yourself informed and ask for your part, uh, for support. There yeah, are specialists out there that can tell you a lot about that. So get yourself help and don't make your failure themselves. Okay, so I'm at the end of the uh, of the seminar and uh, slightly over time. Um, now, um, I wonder if you're open to any question, if you have some question, even when we are over time. Thank you very much, Kurtz, for presenting today. We do have a couple questions rolling on in. I have to excuse my camera for a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> Our first question here is, um, could a standard tact switch be used like a detect switch? A standard tact switch as a 
detect switch. No, t detect switches are intended to be pushed over a long time. And this is not the case for, um, for standard tech switches. So we urgently recommend not to use them like that. And um, yeah, because due to uh, material relaxation over the time uh, inside of the, of the normal tech switch, yeah. Um, for example, you use it under a kind of flap uh, that needs a, a safety uh, switch yeah, when you open it. Yeah, that maybe it uh, has to switch up the, out the, the whole appliance. Then um, you really need uh, to avoid um, any any miss um, misfunction, and therefore um, it needs to be clear that uh, you use a detect switches for that. Even the stroke um, is uh, very low at tact switches, and maybe this is just not enough. And if you maybe uh, have vibration or shock on your device, then it could uh, already um, function. So I hope that was clear yes i believe so uh our next question here we have a, a couple more coming in here what maximum force can be applied to a tact switch oh well that's a very stunk question and uh, it's important to understand um of course uh, the suggestion is not to exceed the testing conditions and the testing conditions mean if you have an operation force with a certain value, and then you have a kind of tolerance, um, which in some cases is uh, yeah, some plus minus uh, several um, gram force. Then if you all add this together, then your application should, or your, the force should not over, uh, be over that value. So, of course, there is a risk um, that the user is ignoring this yeah, with an overforce, but the, the switch underneath can can be really harmed and uh, reducing its lifetime. So uh, a good idea could be, for example, if you have a um, um, standard tech switch and um, you have a kind of activator on top, which uh, has um, a manual or a, a mechanical end stop. So it can't be pushed any deeper and so avoiding to, to push too hard to the onto the switch. We like to think that our users uh, will be using the switches appropriately, but we, we <laughs> yeah, all <exactly>. know. <laughs> Uh, our next question here, and we are running a little bit low on time, but are there many switches available with internal tin plating? And could those use newer tin alloys or layered platings? Internal tin plating. To be honest, in our range, and I can only speak about our range, there are no tin platings inside of the contact area. Of course, we have a tin plating with uh, the, the contacts, the solder contacts, uh, but not inside of the switch. It's either uh, gold or, or silver in the case. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have some more questions rolling in that we're not going to get to today, but have no fear. Uh, since you asked them during our Q&A session, um, we will make sure that they get answered in an email after the presentation. Of course. So thank you very much, Gertz, for mm -hmm. presenting today's topic. Thank you, Emilia. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us for today's Worth Electronic webinar. Uh, don't forget if you have any questions, simply email our webinar team with that follow-up email, webinar team at we-online.com. You will be receiving the video on demand uh, later this week or early next week. Also, don't forget to listen to the New Worth Electronic WhatsApp podcast, where each week we are bringing our application notes, blogs, press releases, and our webinars to an audio format. That is the Worth Electronics WhatsApp radio podcast. It goes live every Thursday at 12 
p.m. Central. And this week's topic is about designing with power modules. So again, you can listen to the WhatsApp podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and all other major podcast streaming networks. Don't forget to join us for next week's webinar on the 27th as we round off the our September already going into October, and we'll be presenting electrical contact resistance. You can register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. That's I'm Amelia Thompson, and I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Have a great time. Thanks. <laughs>